talking today with Ralph Nader, the two-time presidential candidate and author of his latest book, Crashing the Party, How to Tell the Truth and Still Run for President. How does one tell the truth and still run for president? By being authentic. Uh, people may not agree, uh, but at least you say what you mean and mean what you say, which is not true of people like Bush and Gore of the major parties. They go through the campaign in a kind of institutionalized dissembly where they, they don't want to talk about certain things, they evade issues, they avoid questions, they don't meet the press. We met the press every day, uh, at least tried to meet the press every day, all over the country as we campaigned in 50 states. And I think more generically, um, if you address the central contention of politics, which is the distribution of power, and who uses it and who can't use it in our society, you're more likely to be uh, straightforward. But if you ignore that huge central contention of politics, the concentration, distribution, and use of power, uh, then you tend not to be forthright. You miss out on the big issue deliberately. So do you feel then that you're speaking the truth as far as the corporate media was concerned, was um, why you didn't get any significant coverage? Well, the reporters enjoyed covering the campaign when they were assigned, but we got occasional feature coverage. You know, like every two or three months, the LA Times would say, well, I wonder what the Nader uh, Leduc campaign is up against. Send somebody out there. But if you don't get regular coverage, um, you can't compete. If you don't get uh, on the presidential debates, which is a commission created and controlled by the two parties to exclude competitors, uh, you can't compete. All I'm asking is for third parties to have a chance to have a chance to compete, just the way nature allows seeds to sprout to regenerate itself. So, so too is politics, just the way uh, the economy has to allow innovators and small businesses to sprout uh, in order to regenerate itself. And uh, we didn't get that far. I mean, it, it goes to absurd levels. They were, uh, the Washington Post and New York Times were having whole pages on Gore as a college student, Bush at Yale. And when they ran out of uh, material, they, they, they would have an article like the Post had, uh, Gore and family resting in North Carolina. At which point, when I read that in early summer of 2000, I said, I better get myself up to Vermont and flamboyantly relax. Maybe I'll get an article in the Washington Post. You mention uh, colleges and, and universities, and the beginning of your book opens with you talking about speaking at a uh, talk at Drexel University with the Youth in Action group. Um, now, here we have President Bush, who claims he's the uh, education president, and yet I believe he didn't show for that event. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, that was a very, very uh, hard working group all over the country. They had discussions and forums as, as young people. They selected their issues. And then they had a, a very convenient presence at both the Republican National Convention city sites of Philadelphia and Los Angeles, invited the major and minor presidential candidates. And neither Bush nor Gore even showed up. And it was just a couple blocks away. And there was a lot of media there. They could have gotten a lot of media just by uh, going there. So I sat next to an empty chair, which had George W. Bush's name on it, uh, when the Republican National Convention was in Philadelphia. I described this and a lot of other stories in the book just to show that, you know, if you're going to run in politics, you've got to be resilient, you've got to be upbeat. Uh, it's very interesting to make politics something that's of by and for the people for a change. And how are we going to go about that? Um, certainly when you got into the presidential uh, race, you knew what the terrain was already, and you knew that it had to be pretty much slanted against yourself and third-party par politics. Um, how to go about changing that? What do we do? Well, you go about it uh, in more than one election cycle. You've got to break through. You've got to hammer at it, get a People's Presidential Debate Commission may be underway in the United States, very broadly based, uh, connecting with the uh, network uh, television uh, uh, companies and having all, co all kinds of debates to break the monopoly grip of the Commission on Presidential Debates, which is a monopoly by default. It's a private corporation, and, and once NBC, ABC, CBS, CNN decide they're going to transmit those debates and none other, 
then it becomes a monopoly by, de by default. And it closes off the only way a presidential candidate of a, a third party can reach tens of millions of voters. You know, I campaigned in 50 states, uh, huge uh, travel, large crowds, and I didn't reach more than 1.5% of the people I could have reached on one presidential debate interacting with Bush and Gore. And the majority of the people wanted me and Buchanan, according to the polls, on the debate. They don't think the debate should be a cure for insomnia, among other reasons that they registered affirmatively. In fact, I, I seem to remember, I believe it was at the debates, that you actually had paid for a ticket and gotten in. Is that correct? Oh, yes. And it's then... in the book. Uh, this is at University of Massachusetts' first debate, October 3rd, Bush-Gore. And I got a ticket to go to an adjoining auditorium at the university to watch it on closed-circuit television pursuant to a request from Fox News to be a commentator after the debate was over. And I got off the bus. It was at night. Uh, there were thousands of people protesting behind police barricades. And I got off the bus at a parking lot, and I was met by the representative of the debate commission and a state trooper. And the, the representative said, uh, whether or not you have a ticket, you are not invited, and you have to return. And so I started saying, who are you? Who gave you the order? I've got a ticket. What's going on? And a state trooper comes to my elbow and says, if you don't leave, I'm going to have to arrest you. And I said, you've been given an unlawful political order by a private corporation, a sergeant, and you should not implement it. And he basically said, is it your intention to be arrested? So since I prefer to be a plaintiff rather than a defendant, I went back on the bus and filed suit in federal district court for violating my civil rights. And now both the sergeant and the representative of the debate commission and the debate commission and the heads of the debate commission are defendants, and I'm the plaintiff. That should never happen to any presidential candidate. I was a attorney in the state of Massachusetts, and two, two weeks later, the debate commission expelled me from Washington University in St. Louis. Same thing, I had a ticket to go to a student television station on the campus and be interviewed with the producer right next to me. And they still did the same thing. This is the kind of arrogance, this is the kind of uh, anti-democratic outrage that we should not tolerate in the country. Uh, this country does not belong to the Republican Democratic parties. It belongs to open political competition. And that's what I point out in the book. Competition to make this country better and to engage more and more people who are turned off politics because they think it's sleazy, dull, ineffective, and they withdraw and they create a vacuum and the rascals move in and take over. And those rascals are increasingly fewer and fewer giant corporations astride the world who have no allegiance to country or community other than to control it. And this is serious. And Jefferson pointed out this danger, and, and Abraham Lincoln, and Woodrow Wilson, they all worried about uh, concentrated economic power undermining uh, democratic politics. Do you feel that the media was more supportive of their voice in those days than uh, they would be of your voice today? Well, inescapably, because if you were a major party candidate in 1850, the only way you could get attention was from newspapers and posters and large audiences that you spoke to. Now, th that was accessible to challengers. They could, you know, go that way. But now, you see, if you don't have money to get on TV, millions of dollars, you're blacked out on the ads, and, and that means you don't show up in the polls, and if you don't show up in the polls, you don't get news coverage, and it becomes a catch-22 or a vicious circle. And so it's much harder now uh, for people to come from nowhere and prove themselves over a period of months and win elections. Much harder. And yet, as you demonstrated, you had uh, sellout crowds in, in many of these uh, cities, and people paying money, uh, good, yes. good uh, ticket prices, something you would pay for, let's say, a concert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not quite what you pay for a concert, between 10 and $20. We filled Madison Square Garden. We filled the big arena here, Portland, San Francisco, Long Beach, Chicago, Boston. It was wonderful. But part of that was due to uh, my track record over 35 years of trying to make this a better country and safer automobiles and cleaner environment, more accountable government. You know, some people notice and remember. 
So why the uh, Green Party? Why did you uh, link up with them? Why not the Democrats who, although um, have obviously moved into the corporate hands, at least had a power base and could use some serious reform? Well, uh, for 20 years I tried to get the Democrats to, to do uh, the people's work and they spent more time worrying about how much money they're going to raise from business interests and how uh, they were going to try to take the Republicans' issues away from the Republicans in order to win elections. And, you know, when a party develops that kind of orientation where they define themselves by the opposing party, tell people we're the least of the worst, you know, if you don't like what we're doing, the Republicans are worse, so you better vote for us. You know, this, it's a downward slide, and that's what it's been. So how long do you wait? Everybody has their breakaway point, and mine probably was too delayed. I should have broken away in 92 or 96. Being shut out in Washington when your job is to represent civic interests um, to improve government performance is a very serious shutout. And we tolerated it for 20 years after Senator Warren Magnuson left office, the great consumer champion. No one came close to succeeding him. And uh, it's over. The Democrats are never again going to take millions of progressive voters for granted by telling them uh, they got to vote for the Democrats because the Republicans are worse. Because now the, the people can go to the Green Party and at the local, state, and national level. Talk a little bit about the, the Green Party, if you would. There's uh, been rumors since the campaign that maybe the honeymoon's over and that uh, things aren't as, as uh, smooth between you and the Green Party. Not with most Greens. I mean, there, there are a few Greens who are very nitpicking and trivial-minded, and that's true in any political party. They whine and gripe and don't do much work. But the majority of the Greens do work, and that's what we want. Uh, I don't tell Greens what to do. I'm not even a Green registered because I don't want to get involved in intra-Green Party squabbles. I want them to resolve that themselves, and I want to expand the Green Party from the outside. And in, in many states, the Greens are really grappling with important issues and siding with the people, whether they're workers for, lim uh, minimum, for a uh, livable wage or... Uh, trying to preserve our forests or uh, trying to get in national health insurance or trying to reduce poverty, they're there. And the Republicans and Democrats are not there. They're not on the picket lines. They're not at the demonstrations. And I think that's the way the Green Parties are going to grow, by uh, campaigning with neighborhood and community groups who are already motivated to improve their condition. The media covered after the election that you had taken away votes from Al Gore. What's the truth to that? Well, the, every candidate tries to take votes away from their opponents. <laughs> it's the acme of arrogance, you know, to appear like Gore was entitled to certain votes and that I took some of those votes from him. Um, nobody is entitled to votes. We have to earn them. Um, you know, if people say, why did you do this? That's why I wrote the book. And there's over 300 pages of interesting detail about why I ran, how I ran, with whom did I run, and what the future of America can be like if we build a vigorous political and uh, civic uh, set of initiatives in this country. I guess uh, more what I'm getting at, and again, the media's take on it was mm -hmm. that at the, in, the, in the final hours that um, you're, you're running for president, stole the critical votes needed to push Al Gore over right. the top. Well, you know, there are a lot of things that lost for Gore. Why do you pick this one? Why does the media pick this one? This is the easiest one, right? But he lost Tennessee, his home state, pretty unheard of, since his national headquarters were in Nashville for 13 months. Uh, if he won Tennessee, you would have won the presidency. If he won Arkansas, Clinton's home state, you would have won the presidency. If, there are a lot of what-ifs. If he did better on the debates, he was very disappointing on the debates, according to a lot of Democrats. He had won the presidency. So why pick on this one if? Because it, people who pick on this one if are basically saying, don't you know that this is a two-party country? And don't you know that you shouldn't crash the party? And don't you know that you shouldn't have run? I want them to say that right out. I've had people say I should have dropped out. 
uh, how dare I challenge the Democrats since the Republicans are worse. I say, look, the premise, and once you say it straight out, is you don't think people should run to get progressive votes in this country on a third party line. And if you say that, that's the end of the argument, because you're basically saying that there are only certain people who have the right to use constitutional freedoms uh, to run for president. And they better be called either Democrat or Republican. Now, I understand, and you included in your book, that there was a point in time when the Democrats could have actually brought in some of the issues that the Green Party was holding up uh, when uh, Kucinich and uh, Representatives Hayden tried to bring that to the Democratic National Convention. What happened there? It was in Cleveland. They were basically uh, shouted uh, down. They were blocked. Uh, you have to get a certain number of the delegates to, to say, yeah, we think this issue that Kucinich or, or others um, want to have discussed and voted on uh, will get into the arena. And they couldn't even do that. They couldn't even get like you know, a dozen people to say, yeah, let's put it on the table and discuss it, whether or not we agree with it. So a lot of the things like universal health care, like a stronger statement abolishing uh, poverty, like living wage. I mean, if the Democrats can't even discuss this at their platform committee hearings before the convention uh, in Los Angeles, doesn't that tell you something about who controls the Democratic Party? Uh, how many uh, uh, corporate Democrats are really in charge? The Democratic Leadership Council is really in charge? You know, the Democrats cannot win presidential elections without their progressive wing. They can lose presidential elections with their progressive wing, but they can't win presidential elections with their progressive wing alienated, such as African Americans. Uh, and they don't get that yet. They still think that the Green Party was an aberration and like most parties will go away. It's not gonna go away. It has too broad and deep a platform and it's rooted in too many grievances of the American people to go away. So since the election, have you felt that the, uh, or seen numbers that the Green Party is indeed growing and that uh, uh, what's been the, the Democratic Party reaction to that? They still don't have the message. I got a letter a year ago from a CEO of a major company in the U.S. who's a self-declared liberal. And he said, you know, the Green Party still, the Democratic Party still doesn't get the message. And are they going to consign themselves to 30 years of defeat? Uh, in order not to adopt a more progressive agenda. Uh, you know, they can't win without organized labor. They gave organized labor nothing other than to whisper, we're not gonna be as bad as the Republicans. I mean, can you imagine? They don't give the key groups that spell election victory to them anything in return. When uh, Jesse Jackson and Gloria Steinem and others went out trying to downgrade our, uh, our numbers, in uh, the last month before the election in 2000, they didn't demand anything from Gore who sent them on this mission. They could have said, look, you know, we've been critical of you, and boy, have they ever been cl critical of uh, Clinton and Gore over years, burning my ear and other people's ears. And we said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, go support you, but we think you should make a strong statement for universal health care, not step by step the way you did. You should actually talk about poverty, which is like a taboo word now among top Democrats. And uh, you, should, you should say that we should achieve in this country what Western democracies have achieved decades ago out of the rubble of World War II, like full paid maternity leave, paid family sick leave, four-week paid vacation by law, regardless of whether you belong to a union or not that negotiates it not to mention livable wages and universal health care. How come, you know, Belgium and France and Germany and Italy have all these, but we don't? No, they wouldn't say that to them. So they basically were basically taken for granted once again because the Republicans are deemed worse than the Democrats. Well, a choice between the bad and the worse is not good enough. It's not good enough in this country. And these frightened liberals better wake up to that fact. So with... Uh, President uh, Bush uh, being selected as president and all the changes that have occurred in this country since that election, do you think the Green Party is in a better position uh, next election from, from the changes? And do you think the Democrats are uh, 
it doesn't sound from what you're saying that they're catching on. They're not catching on. The only place where the Democrats are going to benefit from the Green Party spillover vote is when there's no Green Party candidate opposing the Democrat on the ballot. Like Maria Cantwell wins by 2,300 votes. I got 103,000 votes. The spillover in her favor, uh, you know, won for her. There was no Democrat, there was no Green Party candidate opposing her, you see. But it, more and more, the Democrats are going to find that they're going to lose more and more progressive votes to the Greens. They won, the Greens won 25% of their local races last November. It's the fastest growing party, the third largest party, at least at the presidential vote level. But I don't think it's growing fast enough. I don't think you can sustain a third party movement by arithmetic. It's got to be geometry. It can't just be, well, in 2000, there were um, 270 candidates at the local level and 40 members of the Green Party running for the House. It's got to be multiples of that. It's got to be tens of thousands. Because the more people who run, the more epicenters of activity on behalf of the Green Party they generate. So that's my concern right now. It's not growing fast enough. There are not enough people going into the Green Party and running for office. And that's what I'm encouraging them to do. And do you think the um, the media's lack of focus on your campaign this last time around and, and, and the time previous is an encouraging sign for other people to step forward or a discouraging one? I think it's, it'll be a discouraging one, but they should overcome it. There are all kinds of new ways to try to break through, new ways of campaigning, new ways of getting out the vote, uh, new ways of uh, generating uh, issues that will get news at the local level. We did get news at the local level in most places, not in Georgia or places where we couldn't get on the ballot, uh, but we did get news. But it's at the national level. I mean, people uh, reverberate to national political movements that are covered regularly, not you know every two months or every four weeks in features. And, you know, when they were saying, the media was saying, I might cost Gore the election just before the voting day, even then they didn't cover me daily. We had a van with 14 seats and they were half empty as we went around the country. So they really in a rut themselves in terms of thinking that it's only Republicans and Democrats that command newsworthiness criteria. What changes would you like to see in the media, uh, changes that can help be affected by your average citizen to bring democracy back into our system? Well, I'd like to see uh, more uh, time on the public airways controlled by the audience. We need an audience network. The people, as the saying goes, own the public airways. They're the landlords, the radio and TV stations are the tenants. They're licensed free by the Federal Communications Commission, and they decide who says what 24 hours a day and who doesn't say what. It's too much power over our property. This is the Commonwealth. It belongs to the people, uh, and we need at least an hour prime time and drive time to establish an audience network where memberships fund the studios, etc., reporters. And it could be chartered by the Congress. We had a congressional hearing in 1991 on this idea by Congressman Markey, who was head of the telecommunications uh, subcommittee then, but it didn't go anywhere. The members of Congress are petrified of the broadcasting lobby for all the obvious reasons. In the current Bush administration, I believe uh, Michael Powell is in charge of the FCC. With appointments like that, do you think we really stand a chance against uh, the further corporatization of of the media. No. He wants more to allow more mergers, more consolidation. I guess he's not satisfied that uh, three or four giant radio conglomerates are moving to own most of the radio stations in the country. Before the Telecommunications Act of 96, which Republicans and Democrats supported, remember this was under Clinton, there was no company who could own more than 12 radio stations. Now one company owns over 1,100 radio stations and growing week by week. That's, that means more syndicated, standardized, fair. It means less local reporters. It means less voice for the American people. It means more trivialization of the public airways by the tenants uh, away from the landlords who own that property. So it's not very good in that sense. We do need more community newspapers. We do, there's a, a 
interesting uh, development in Connecticut where what's called the Voice Weekly papers are written by the readers. And the ads are similar to the ads in Community Weekly Weeklies, but there are no reporters. It's, it's written by reader contributions, and it's making a go of it. It's in Winstead, Connecticut. It's based in Winstead, Connecticut, and it's called The Voice. Anybody who's interested in doing it in this neck of the woods, uh, just call up Jed Gould, who is the founder of The Voice, and you can get an idea of how he's done it. And he's, he's doing it in about seven towns in northwest Connecticut which happened to be my home, home territory, by the way. Um, and then we need uh, to support more community radio stations and, and, uh, and do it in a way where we, we expect the vibrant, robust debate and coverage, good features, good culture, good arts. It's really too bad that the radio and TV now is over 90% entertainment and advertisements. And the entertainment is pretty tawdry by and large. Uh, even the music is pretty tawdry at times. So uh, you, uh, you see this frittering of the public airways. And of course, Bush and Gore would never touch that issue. And I campaigned on that issue. See, that's another way of running for president and still telling the truth. You, you really can't tell the truth if you censor yourself, as Bush and Gore have repeatedly. And basically, avoid, deliberately avoid, talking about major issues that people running for president should be talking about and taking a stand on. Gat and NAFTA were another common uh, discussion. They weren't debated because they both had the same positions. Right, and the issues of globalization. Mm -hmm. How about the, uh, staying with the media for just one more, um, the independent media centers and low-power FM, do you see those as uh, hopeful signs? Hopeful, but then, you know, uh, Clinton's did support uh, licensing several hundred uh, community FM stations, which, by the way, were, would have been prohibited from having ads and had to be nonprofit and couldn't have more than 10 watts. And that was too much for the broadcasting lobby, and they swarmed over Capitol Hill. They got over 300 members of the House, including many, many Democrats, to side with them, and they squelched the Federal Communications Commission which had issued a few dozen licenses, and then they blocked it. So even these neighborhood radio uh, stations were not allowed uh, by the powerful, avaricious commercial broadcast industry. And this all started out with Secretary of Commerce Hoover in the 1920s believing that the young radio industry should be nonprofit, should have no ads, and should be a public trust. And that battle was lost in the 30s in the struggle between the educational nonprofit interests for radio stations and the commercial interests. And it's been all downhill ever since, with the exception of public radio and a few community radio stations that have cropped up, like Pacifica. Which is in a battle itself. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about Enron, because my hopes uh, have been a little bit bolstered with the media coverage of the fiasco there, and yet the, uh, the pessimist inside me says that this is all going to die out and they're not going to really cover any of the real issues around it. What's well, your take That's on a it? realistic uh, prospect, unless we, the people, start protesting and collaring our senators and representatives saying, we're not going to let you get away with this. Uh, having investigative hearings and doing nothing by way of passing reform legislation to protect pensions, to protect investors, uh, to, to protect uh, the integrity of the securities market, to protect workers who are ripped off by uh, executives who sell out high uh, and leave the workers in the lurch and go bankrupt. Uh, no, it's not gonna, we're not going to let you do that. You did it after the savings and loan. You, you used a half a trillion dollars of our money in principal and interest to bail out the crooked and, and mismanaged savings and loans in the late 80s and early 90s, and you passed no bank reform legislation. So this is the great opportunity. Enron can be a great engine in, inadvertently for corporate crime enforcement, adequate prosecutorial budgets, and a, a, a very good economic reform move to protect workers, pension holders, and small investors. So we have organized a coalition that's going to get bigger and bigger, and the website is citizenworks.org to follow it, citizenworks.org. We had a press conference a few days ago. It was carried live on C-SPAN, which, by the way, is one of the few great innovations in communications in our country. 
that was carried live and for one hour. And uh, those of you who are interested in, in joining this corporate reform movement, just contact uh, citizenworks.org or uh, just uh, uh, write us at P.O. Box 19367, uh, Washington, D.C., 20036. P.O. Box 19367, Washington, D.C., 20036. You know, this book now, as I told you so, it's full of, it's full of information about what excessive corporate power has done to our politics, our environment, our schools, our universities, our workplace, our con control of our human genes, our privacies. And I hate to say it, but for years I've been saying that the main subversion of our democratic society will come not from some uh, dictator. It will come from authoritarian, multinational corporations who want more and more control at the expense of popular sovereignty. The book also offers a lot of uh, references and places for people to turn as well. So it, uh, you see it as a, a toolbox sort of? Yes, it things. shows on page 319, uh, 10 first stage uh, objectives for America to achieve. It's got uh, appendices. Uh, it's got names of people who supported us. Uh, it's got uh, lots of material for people who want to get engaged, people who uh, want to make a difference, people who are mystified by the political process, this helps demystify it. It's a lot of fun. Justice is fun. But tiring, I would have to imagine. <laughs> but renewing. All right, any uh, last words? Talking with uh, Ralph Nader, of course. Yes, I mean, as I say, this book is not just a memoir. It tries to convey the excitement of new political movements and all the good people who supported us and how important it is to campaign with so many citizen and community groups made up of great people, whether it's trying to save the Everglades or to deal with public housing in, in South Central um, Los Angeles or high asthma levels among kids in Hartford or fighting the Red Sox who want to have the taxpayer pay for a new ballpark, uh, neglecting neighborhood needs. You, you know about that here in Seattle, huh? tax-funded yeah, we, stadiums. we've had several. Um, so, it, it, and, and it does try to induce people to engage and have a higher estimate of their own significance so that when they pass this world on to their uh, children and grandchildren, they can answer questions from their children and grandchildren about how they made the world better.